right, this is it, our final PowerPoint of the year. Our exam is about 10 days out, and I'm going to be splitting modern art of the uh, 1900s up into two PowerPoints. They really won't be long. These are not going to be something that were as long as some of the other PowerPoints we've looked at before. Um, so let's get into it. Modern art really is considered the art of the 1900s, um, and when you say contemporary art, that is really art of the last 30 years. So that that's where we are chronologically. We just left off... Uh, uh, the 1800s, looking at Art Nouveau, looking at symbolism, looking at Impressionism and Post-Impressionism, and now we're going to see how the industrial world, World War One and World War II, um, and a lot of other uh, events really affect the creation of art uh, in this century of the 1900s. All right, so as we start... Uh, in the 1900s, there is a lot of different movements, and the way that the art history curriculum is broken up is that you have, I don't know, I, I, somewhere around 50 pieces of art that you need to know from the 1900s, uh, and usually you have one piece of art from every artistic movement. So with, like, Baroque art, you may, we may have had, you know, four, five, six pieces for that just that one movement. Uh, for modern art, there's a lot of different movements and a lot of different pieces. So it may feel as if it's like kind of scattered. It may feel a little chaotic. Uh, but the way I structured it is before I talk about each piece of art in this PowerPoint, I talk a little bit about the movement itself, and then I go into the piece of art that you have to know for the image set. Okay, so our first movement that we're going to take a look at is something called Fauvism. Uh, and Fauvism is, it really uh, is, was a negative name which meant wild beast so it's known for really intense and bright colors a lot of times these colors clash uh, you might have some distorted forms or maybe a distorted perspective with some lighthearted themes. Uh, they're influenced a lot by the post-impressionists like Gauguin and Van Gogh. You'll see a lot of uh, rigorous brushstrokes, some flat linear patterns. You might even see some bare canvas. Um, but again, this movement really is, is, is taking place between the uh, years of 1904 to 1908, and it was really seen as an insult uh, because of their brutal use of color, which is where the term uh, wild beast comes from, a fall. So let's take a look at the one that you have to know. So very intense colors, kind of very quick brush strokes. Uh, Matisse is kind of the number one fall painter that you have to know. Uh, if you ever go to the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia, great uh, museum, and they have a lot of Matisse paintings. Uh, but Matisse does have a very kind of characteristic style. What we see here is it's like we see the top and the side of this table. We normally, you know, if we were looking at this realistically, we see a chair rail there, we see flowers in a garden, uh, but we see the top of the of the table but we also see the side view of the fish. So we've got these broad ca uh, patches of color. This will kind of influence color uh, field painting that will happen later on where you have just really like saturated colors uh, on paper. Um, and then we also see these contrasts between green and pink and orange and yellow. Um, so it's kind of like also a, a mixture of a, of a still life here as well. So we're going to take a look now at, and moving throughout Europe, to German Expressionism. And German Expressionism uh, really is influenced by the horrors of World War I. So it occurs between 1905 and 1915. Uh, the expressive use of color and shape, uh, you'll see human figures and animals are often distorted. Uh, they, the artist is trying to express their inner feelings and truth over reality. Um, they dislike the effects of, of industrialization, and they are reacting as a group against the social changes of industrialization. They're influenced by uh, the previous period, the Falves, uh, because of their intense color. Uh, so let's take a look at our first artist. So we, there are a couple of artists in this German Expressionist period. Our first is Ernst Kirchner. It's him as a soldier. So it's him after fighting in the war and then him before fighting in the war. So we have this dramatic use of clashing colors. Uh, he was an unwilling volunteer uh, in World War I, but he was forced, he was still drafted, but he just became a driver for the infantry. Uh, he was unfit for service because he had a lot of medical issues, and it was painted while he was recuperating from a mental breakdown. We saw that before with Vincent van Gogh. 
So he's missing his right hand, which kind of indicates the feeling that he has has an, an inability to paint because he is is so traumatized by his time in the in the in the military as well as his mental breakdown. Um, and the model that's in the rear of the painting kind of represents how he used to paint. He used to paint very classical images of of human figures, and you know the nude is a very simple human figure that is seen all throughout artistic history. And it has almost like a nightmarish quality with the stretched faces, the very harsh brush strokes. So kind of a very, very uh, different take of blending expressionism and symbolism and also fauvism. So we see here really the influence of post-impressionism, uh, fauvism, expressionism, uh, and symbolism. Now, the next artist is very different. His is Vasily Kandinsky. Again, these are all Germans. Uh, this is called Improvision 28. The second version is an oil on a canvas. It's from 1912. And he is the first European to paint completely in non-representational paintings. His colors and lines represent music concepts and spirituality. So Kandinsky wanted the viewer to respond to a painting in the same way that a person would respond to a musical composition. It's abstract. You can't see it. You can't see the notes, but you hear them. Here, you see it, and you may not be able to actually understand understand it but it's meant to give you a feeling almost a whimsical quality of what he would think of as notes flying through the air that is what he is trying to conduct here on the canvas and then finally the final uh German expressionist that you need to know is a female painter. This is Kathy Kollowitz, and it's the memorial sheet for Karl Liebknecht, from, and this was created from 1919 to 1920. It's a woodcut. So again, we've seen woodcuts before, uh, like Albrecht Dorr's from Germany, uh, and again, she is a German artist as well. We see the dramatic use of black and white here to magnify the grief, uh, and grief does dominate this painting. Uh, you see there the uh, the person lying in co in their coffin. Uh, these are mourners really at a funeral, and it is a reaction to a real uh, situation. So in 1919, Liebkrit was shot to death during a communist uprising in Berlin called the Spartacus Revolt. Now, in this painting, you don't know the political undertones of this, the ideas of communism and the revolution that was taking place or the revolt that took place, but you do feel the emotion. Okay, you feel that sense of sorrow that these people have. And also, make sure you're writing down everything in red. So now we're going to get into Picasso. So Picasso wasn't just a Cubist painting. He painted in, in realistic styles. He was trained uh, classically, uh, just like other artists were throughout uh throughout Europe, and he experienced two other periods before his Cubist period. So his blue period uh, was influenced by the suicide of a friend of his, so all his paintings appear to be somewhat depressing, as well as they have the blue hue like you see here. This is the old guitarist, and again influenced by a trip uh, through Spain and the suicide of a friend. Then he experienced what we would call his rose period, more cheery, usually features lots of pinks and oranges and tans, uh, often see carnival figures uh, that he would have seen in, in Spain, and he, it was influenced really by a warm relationship with a mistress. So this is his early 1900s. Now, he will be influenced by artists such as Cezanne. And once he sees artwork by Cezanne, he sees how Cezanne arranges the world into blocks of color. And he is going to take that and really try to deconstruct the human form and only show one shape uh, of a human, but from maybe different angles. And that's where we get cubism. So the influence comes from Cezanne, whose work was on display at a retrospective in 1907 at the Salon des Autons. And in cubism, the artists are looking at objects, they are analyzed, they're broken down, and then they're reassembled in an abstract form. So instead of just depicting an object from one viewpoint, the artist may depict uh, the subject from the multiple viewpoints to represent uh, the subject almost in a greater context or show kind of maybe one side of an object. And here we have his his number one work, uh, Les Demoiselles de Avignon, or the Ladies of Avignon. Uh, this is from 1907. It's a large work. It's at the Met in New York City. It is considered a foundational work of art history because it's the first truly Cubist work. It's influenced too by African masks, which you can see on the two women on the far right hand side. They are nude. They were prostitutes, um, and they are all kind of deconstructed, especially their faces and their bodies. Uh, it's a landmark painting uh 
African and oceanic art is conveyed uh, through the abstract forms and the simplicity. Think of also like the female deity from Pacific art. And you see here five women who are prostitutes. We have a, a fruit dish, which uh, kind of symbolizes that, that vanity, that vanitas painting from, from Dutch uh, still lifes. We see the interest in the abstract forms and the figures of on the left are from Iberia, which is kind of from Spain. And on the right is more of an African influence. So that's kind of what we see here. His major influence is Iberia is Spain and on the, the right is, is Africa. We see here uh, Native American and Pacific and African uh, cultures, how they are influencing Picasso. Uh, one of the other people that Picasso worked with, uh, his name was George Brock. He was a Portuguese man, and this is called the Portuguese. It's analytic cubism, this is. So he uses kind of subdued hues to put more attention on form, and the subject is really dissected. He's a Portuguese musician, um, and you we see him and his guitar. If you look kind of down below, we see the opening of the acoustic guitar with some guitar strings, and what Brock is doing is he is rejecting pictorial illusionism um, that currently dominated Western art. This is not really a portrait, it's an analysis. And then we also have Cubist sculpture. Uh, it goes on to influence Cubist sculpture, uh, a movement in Russia called constructivism and also futurism. And just as painting was rooted in Cezanne's reduction of the painted objects into component planes and geometric solids, we will see that again too in, in, in sculpture. So this is Constantine Brancusi. This actually is in uh, the Philadelphia Museum of Art. This is called the Kiss. It is made out of stone. It is these two figures intertwined. Um, they have become almost one, and they have this almost cyclopean eye. They have one eye. Uh, the man is on, if you're looking at our photo here, the man is on the left. He's a little bit bigger than her. His eye is bigger. Uh, his hair is also shorter if we were to see from the other side. Uh, it's very minimalist. And you also have uh, the breasts of the woman. She's a little bit uh, thinner in terms of body, and she's got long hair. Uh, he's left in the rough surface of the stone, uh, which contributes to a feeling of naturalism. And it was an artistic break from that very high, highly polished sculpture we saw from Rodin or Bernini or Michelangelo. So this is kind of incorporating natural elements as well as breaking down humans into very basic forms. Then we get photography. So photography has, you know, been an invention at this point for, a, you know, 80 years. This is 1907. It's called Alfred Stieglitz. This is the steerage. And the steerage really was, he, he was known for his diagonals and he was known for not posing his people in any kind of way, in any way, which kind of showed his influence by cubism a little bit. Uh, so the, the photograph world here was the world as he saw it. He didn't arrange people and he allowed people at events to make their own depictions. And he's depicting here the poorest passengers uh, who were on a ship, and they were only allowed to come above deck uh, for very short periods of time on the ship. So we've got people who are essentially like immigrants who are coming to America here, and it's them uh, coming up for air just for a very short period of time and showing kind of the plight of uh, immigrants as they go from Europe to America. Now on to a, a movement that is really kind of odd to some people. So it's called the Dada movement, and it literally means hobby horse. And it lasted from 1916 to 1925. Uh, it, it, it starts in Europe. It will spread to the United States. And artists were kind of disillusioned by World War I. And, and artists are going to accept the dominance of the artistic concept over actually creating something. And we will see that in Marcel Duchamp's The Fountain, which is also in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. This is porcelain or china with uh paint with a little bit of black paint which says r mutt 1917 uh and this is considered a ready-made sculpture so it was fabricated and made in a factory the artist is taking it repositioning it and creating a concept around it so even though they themselves didn't make it they created the concept around the piece of art and that's really what dada is so duchamp found this in a plumbing supply store and deemed it a work of art it's designed it is it is it took a human imagination to create this really it's a urinal it's not a fountain if you were to put this up it looks like it belongs you know in a urinal in a man's in a men's bathroom he signed it R. Mutt, which was a pun on a comic strip uh, that was uh, about a plumber in France in the 
the early 1900s. And the fountain can be seen as an experimental reply by Duchamp testing the commitment of this new artistic society that was set up in the United States uh, that allowed artists to to freely express themselves. And what eventually happens is they kind of reject this, and it sits like in the back of this exhibit. And the original one is actually lost uh, when the exhibit is cleaned up, and Duchamp actually creates more of these in, later in the 1900s. So it's really about the concept, not about the actual execution of the artist actually making art. That is Dada, and that's eventually going to really influence pop artists later on. So the next movement is something called constructivism, and constructivism was really big in the communist uh, – communist era era of Russia in the early 1900s. So this is a female artist, uh, Vavara Stepanova. It's called The Illustration from the Results of the First Five-Year Plan. Uh, this was created in 1932. It's a little bit multimedia here. It's like a collage. It celebrates the communist revolution. You've got Lenin in the upper right-hand corner. You've got these uh, these these uh, parades with 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 Russian, uh, the Russian military. It originally uh, po was portrayed in a very large book uh, that was a two-page spread. It was influenced a little bit by Cubism, the way she has things cut up and positioned. And the five-year plan uh, in Russia was trying to modernize Russia, but many people died, and, and, and that is being overlooked here. The fact that when Stalin comes in um, and the five-year plan is being instituted, people are literally going to die because of the hard work they put in to trying to modernize and get Russia on the same footing as modern European and American the American country. So surrealism uh, is also taking place in the mid uh, to early 1900s, and you have two types of surrealism, and surrealism really is you're blurring the real world with fantasy. So sometimes you have uh, biomorphic surrealism, which is uh, Joan Miro, and they were largely just really abstract images, and then you also have naturalistic surrealism, where you have Dali and Magritte, where you might have real people in the real world, but the scene itself is not realistic. So think of like the melting clocks by Dali, that's naturalistic uh, surrealism. And the one that we're going to take a look at is the object uh, from 1936 by Marit Oppenheim. So Marit Oppenheim is a female artist and said to have been done after Picasso claimed that anything looks good in fur. The artist said even this cup and saucer. Uh, and it's also a female comment um, on working in a male-dominated world of the male-dominated world of sculpture. So you have kind of some erotic overtones, the softness of 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 the fur uh, a saucer and 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 the spoon going into the cup kind of simulates the idea of sex so you have kind of this juxtaposition of, of men and women and a female commenting on the being a part of this male world of of sculpture and then we have Frida Kahlo, one of the most famous uh, female artists of the 1900s she didn't really see herself as a surrealist um, she thought she was painting you know painting whatever she wanted essentially she didn't want to be classified so what you have here is two portraits of herself and on the left she is uh, dressed as a Spanish lady in white lace which links her to her European heritage and then on the right she's dressed as a Mexican peasant um, and you see the kind of the stiffness and provincial quality of Mexican folk art that was really an inspiration to her growing up uh, and then you have her heart uh, exposed which is kind of the surrealist element here and then with the uh, the scissors and the cutting of the cord there uh, with her blood vessel and the blood on her dress that symbolizes how she had lost uh, many kids or uh, not many children but she had had many miscarriages and she had also had abortions and then in the one hand she's got a little uh, a little locket with the portrait of her husband and she had just lost him because they had gotten divorced so really this is a painting about loss and the two kind of cultures that Frida was coming from um, as she was growing up and how she saw herself as an adult. So when uh, Refredo Lamb uh, is an artist who painted a painting called The Jungle. It is actually done on paper that was mounted on canvas. Uh, we see some faces here. You can't see a whole lot of them. Whoops. So we have some of the faces here and over here. They're influenced by African masks. We have this like long vertical lines. Uh, he is a Cuban artist, and he's trying to really address the history of slavery in Cuba. Um, he is influenced by African art, Cuba sculpture, and surrealist paintings, and it's really meant to be uh, slaves picking sugarcane. And you can kind of see the long stalks here for the sugarcane, and then the influence of that on contemporary culture within Cuba. 
now on to a, uh, a a period of art that is kind of hard for some people to understand why this is art. It's called De Stiel, and it comes out of Denmark. And it's a movement that kind of reaches its height in 1917 to 1930. And the artists here are making art that is completely abstract and there's no reference to nature no reference to humans and the they will use white backgrounds and black lines and they will only also use primary colors of red white and blue and the most famous de stil artist is piet modrian and this is his composition with red blue and yellow painted on canvas and he created a work that did not show recognizable images or even infer depth he wanted to achieve honesty in artwork and he wanted to move beyond painting naturalistic depictions to focus instead on the material properties of paint and its unique ability to express ideas abstractly using formal elements such as line and color and in our next video we are going to get into the architecture of the 1900s and we will start talking about Mr. Franklin Lloyd Wright and the Prairie Style.